News 18, India. I'm no, glad you mentioned reforms. I think big message coming from you that the government will con continue on the road for reforms. Uh, you know, what are the, I've, I've said this to you before that, you know, uh, cutting the rich tax last year, you know, in an election year, before that, you know, cutting the corporate rate tax. I mean, you've taken some bold measures. What are the next level of reforms that we can expect from, from you? Broadly, I mean, directionally. No, first of all, as I said, the system to become more transparent. More things will have to be done in order to make sure that we work together with states. It's one thing for the union government to work on those areas which are exclusively with the central government. But where, are, where there are overlaps, there are some states which have come about enthusiastically to say, yes, we should benefit also from this vibrancy which results after such uh, measures are taken. And therefore, when reforms are talked about, we normally always say three levels where it has to be carried out with the same vigor. Yes. The central government, the state government, and then the local bodies. Yes. Now, working with the state governments has already started happening. The last few years, you see very many areas where we are working together. The local body level, the municipal urban local bodies, the panchayats, we need to have greater um, interchange of ideas and working together with them also. That will also continue now. Okay. Finance Minister, if I were to ask you this one question, with the exception of Air India, no strategic privatization has taken place, any significant. You know, whether it is IDBI, Concor, uh, SCI, banks. Uh, why, why has your government sort of repeatedly kind of underperformed on this disinvestment aspect? I mean, is the thinking changing within the government? Are you looking at sort of strategic sales and not maybe offer to sell? Uh, completely. Is there some shift in the thinking? I would want you to first of all put that question into the frame that I have laid in the matter of public sector enterprises policy. Right. If a policy framework has been announced and in that we have said that there are only core strategic sectors which government recognizes where the government will be having a minimal presence. And even in those sectors, private sector will be allowed to, or it will be completely open for them to participate in total. In the sense, there will not be any one sector, inclusive of the core strategic sector, which will be exclusively reserved for public sector, whereby consolidation will have to happen to make them big enough for a big country like India. Efficiencies will have to be brought in their values will have to be increased. So this question of yours will have to fit into that frame. I, I will not reverse any of the cabinet approved decisions. Okay. But at the same time, you should probably also have noticed that for each of them, we are working to make sure, we are not allowing them to remain there till they are getting disinvested. Equally, we are working to make sure that their valuations are kept up they are improved upon. That if you look at the public sector listing, listed companies and their valuation in the market today, you see the kind of vibrancy which has been brought in into them. Their share values have gone up. The dividends are even much better than earlier. Absolutely. So, disinvestment is one thing, but in bringing value to them and make sure that the markets look at them Absolutely favorably. No, in fact, the public sector companies have done really well, you know, uh, in, and public markets are also where they are. Would you consider sort of diluting your stake maybe to 49% in some of, the, some of the companies, thereby they are not government-owned, but at the same time you have best of both the worlds, of and the valuations is, could go up even further? No, certainly. That is not something which uh, has been uh, uh, denied earlier, meaning as a matter of policy, but in many ways we are already, you will see periodically, the DPAM yes. uh, department which takes care of the disinvestment has slowly in trickles released a lot of government's shares into the market so that private ownerships can come in and they can take hold of those shares. So that is happening already and we'd certainly like to make sure that greater participation, public ownership. So of in companies like let's say SBI or ONGC, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean th this, this could be another possibility. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, 
One of the big ideas this budget, which struck to everyone as a big idea, uh, has been the announcement of a corpus of one lakh crore, uh, you know, to provide interest-free or low-interest sort of loans for research and innovation. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? How will this work? Uh, will there be a separate sort of uh, entity managing this? How will it, how will it go forward? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, first of all, would bring in a bit of a context to, to this. It's not as if we are doing it now for the first time. Earlier, too, there were several funds within different departments like the science and technology. Um, uh, they had a CSIR, its own. Funds were all over the place. You had them doing supportive activities for innovation, each from their own side. Two years ago, I remember announcing the National Research Foundation, which brought together all these uh, you know, thinly spread resources to one uh, pool, and from there, each of the departments would claim whatever they would want to uh, fund in terms of innovation supportive activities. But what we have now done is, they may remain so, but the government would now bring in a kind of a institution or a vehicle which can take this one lakh crore which will be given to them next few years in total uh, as an interest free corpus amount. Using that, they can then identify innovation related exercises which are happening in uh, private sector and fund them. I may give this interest-free 50-year loan to the corpus, but the managers of that fund will then decide to whom at what cost should they give it. The cost may vary depending on the risk factors and the judgment of the professionals who will manage it. But it's certainly a fund from where private innovation will be supported. Got it. Uh, I'm sure you'll be asked this question in future, but you know the allocation for CapEx at 11.1 .1 lakh crore, does it seem like a lofty goal, considering that you know uh, you could not even do 10 lakh crore uh, in this year? No, but not really. I mean, we, we've done only 2 lakh, 3 lakh. That's not the case. Yeah. We're closer to 10. It's also because absorption has its own limits, whether it's the states or the departments within Government of India. When the capital expenditure is undertaken through the outlays given to them, it is only that much within 12 months that they can do and not beyond. So sometimes reaching the target, however ambitious it is, is to the last mile difficult within 12 months. Had we given them a few more months, they will probably even complete that. But the condition for these capital expenditure, which I have announced since last two years, three years, is that that amount should be utilized within the year. So many of the state governments which take the money, which are very good in implementing. In fact, I find states very enthusiastic in wanting to avail of this facility. The difficulty comes that if you restrict them to using it within 12 months, and which is what we aim at, we want them to use it within 12 months. So I'm not saying restrict in that sense, but within 12 months when you expect it to spend that money, there are times when completely utilizing it becomes difficult. They partly use it. That is why 10 lakhs, you might reach 9, 9.2, and not touch 10, but achieving 9.2 within a matter of 12 is, I think, good enough. So to increase it to 11, I'm very hopeful it will definitely get used. And uh, the amounts which are being given to states are also having high utilization. Dhrunaji, if I'm right, we get a sense that there is an indication of tapering of government spending. Uh, you know. I know you've, we've discussed this in our last interview as well. Uh, you expect private sector also now to do some heavy lifting. So we, we, are, we are seeing some of, the, you know, some of the sectors looking up now. There are investments in steel, aviation, power, machinery. Some of, but are you happy with, with the level of private sector participation? You said that you know, they are like Hanuman, and Hanuman has no idea of you know, his own power. When do you think that this Hanuman will lift the economy mountain? Well, I think, as you said, they are coming out. There is investment happening. The PIL, uh, no, uh, P PLI. PIL, PLI scheme is also helping them. Yes. So investments in newer areas do have a slightly longer gestation period. It's not as if their brownfield projects are getting additional money. That also is happening. 
But the interest in the sunrise sector is really obvious now. People are taking a lot of interest and you're seeing them coming forward. Okay. So that's heartening news. Uh, you know, one, one more question on the stress that is being seen in the rural economy. You know, your higher allocation outlay to Manrega also in, is an indication, betrays, uh, you know, the stress on rural economy. Uh, you know, if you look at the results of FMCG companies, consumer durable companies, uh, you know, even if you look at the Nielsen data, it shows that the rural volume growth has underperformed urban volume growth for almost seven quarters now in a row. So what is your prognosis of rural demand and how do you think we will deal with this going forward? I'm not sure if I'll be able to describe how I view uh, what is happening in the rural areas. Let us recognize that there is a lot of shift in the way employment is panning out. Let us recognize that migration is now looking at redefining itself in a way. Many people who went back to their villages with some skills acquired are wondering if they can continue being there and utilizing and benefiting from the skills that they've acquired. Uh, industries too today are allowing a lot of work from home and many who are avoiding traveling are also staying back. So the shift will have to be recognized. But equally, that's not to say people are staying back home without work or staying back and working from there with large companies being established everywhere else. So there is a transition happening undoubtedly. Yes. Second, there's also this little savings which is coming through, which we are seeing from the various fixed deposits which are growing as different from small savings. Yes. You're also seeing some middle class looking at savings through the stock markets, DMAT accounts and so on. So the indicators with which we are looking at the rural economy may vary and there are very many newer indicators which we may not want to miss out on. Yes, I agree FMCG uh, market will also tell us that uh, consumable, durable consumables are not being consumed as much as before. Yes. But, well, I take that as one indicator, but equally, the kind of activities which are now happening in the rural areas, because of better connectivity, because of other uh, digitization, are also yet to be measured, I would think. 